Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Yes. Okay. You do Welcome. Welcome. Nine o'clock, ten past nine on a Saturday morning on a beautiful day. Terrific. Well done. Thank you very much for coming. And, and again, I'll say what I said last night was thank you for, for the folks who invited us. Um, we had a we had a wonderful flight over. It was just an amazing thing. It was like eleven hours from uh, from London to Los Angeles, but we had a couple of hours before that, three hours before that, from Stockholm to London. Um, and we made our connections, and it was all all right. It's just wonderful. Uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna rattle through the steps uh, as they're laid out in the big book, and we're gonna hopefully um, we might actually uh, come across some stuff that you haven't considered before. Um, the lay aside prayer um, that we used at the beginning of this. Uh, this thing um, is not actually in the big book, it's, but it's referenced. And what I have is um, some sheets that have got the references from the big book. I'll leave them out there lunchtime. You can pick them up, whatever. Um, whatever. Okay, so I better introduce myself. My name is Peter Misson. I am a recovered alcoholic. Hi, Peter. Uh, I was born in the island of Jersey, uh, which is some, somewhere between France and England. Uh, 70,000 alcoholics clinging to a rock in the middle of the English Channel. I was one of those 70,000 alcoholics. Um, my sober date is December the 11th, 1981, which is a heck of a long time ago. Um, I stayed sober through a period in my, in my sobriety uh, 15 years, 16 years ago now. Uh, not by any power of me, there was something keeping me sober. Uh, left to me, I'd be drunk. Um, I started to look at this big book and see what was really in it. And since then, I've been trying to live by whatever it says this book says. Um, I've read it and reread it. It's the only book in my life that I've ever reread and reread. And every time I reread it, I see something new. Seriously. I, I, I go through this book about three or four times a year on, on Skype meetings. I, I keep seeing something new every time. I'm reading it. I'm going, I never saw that. I didn't say it out loud, but I say, oh, I've never seen that before. Because it speaks to my heart and not my head. And it speaks to our experience, not, not our intellect. And if anything that we get out of this, this weekend um, is that don't let us read the big book for you. Get your own experience of what this big book says. Because that's what it was based on, was the experience of the first 100 who wrote it. And it's meant to produce the experience in us so that we have our own experience with whatever is written in here. We are going to share our experience. It may be different to yours. But we say, follow these directions and you will have a personal experience <coughs> with what I call recovery. Well, we call it recovery, but you will get to a place where you are recovered. That's the first promise in the book. So... What we're going to start is, we're going to start off, Margaret, you better introduce yourself. Okay? Yes, thank you. My name is Margarita and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Um, I had that moment of clarity that I talked about yesterday and I had nothing to do with that. And that was the gift of desperation that God gave me so that I became willing to search for a solution. And I found the solution in this book and these steps. This is, like you said, Karen, it's a life-changing program. It's a plan for recovery from alcoholism. It's a plan to come from point A to point B. And I did that and I recovered. And after 40 years of drinking and being so sick, so sick, you know, this, this program is just amazing. And it was written for us. Yeah. So the, we are going to start with the, to read from um, A Vision for You, because that was 
uh, what happened to Peter when he read that uh, and it spoke to his heart and he knew this is me and that was what happened to me when I picked up this book at my last treatment center and I read this and I knew that this is me. So we're going to start reading that and I will read if I can find it. <laughs> Chapter 11, A Vision for You. For most normal folks, drinking means com conviviality, companionship and colorful imagination. It means release from care, boredom and worry. It is joyous intimacy with friends and the feeling that life is good. But not so with us in those last days of heavy drinking. The old pleasures were gone. They were but memories. Never could we recapture the great moments of the past. There was an insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did and a heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do, to do it. There was always one more attempt and one more failure. Ask yourself, is that you? Is that you? Is that me? That me? The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself. As we became subjects of King Alcohol, shivering denizens of his mad realm, the chilling va vapor that is loneliness settled down. It thickened, ever, ever becoming blacker. Some of us sought out sordid places, hoping to find understanding, companionship, and approval. Momentarily we did. Then would come oblivion and the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen. Terror, be be bewilderment, bewilderment. bewilderment uh, frustration, despair. Unhappy drinkers who read this page will understand. Do you understand? I understood the moment I heard it. Now and then, a serious drinker being dry at the moment says, I don't miss it at all. Feel better, work better, having a better time. As ex-problem drinkers, we smile at such a sally. We know our friend is like a boy whistling in the dark to keep up his spirits. He fools himself. Inwardly, he would give anything to take a half a dozen of drinks and get away with them. He will presently try the old game again, for he isn't happy about his sobriety. He cannot picture life without alcohol. Someday he will be unable to imagine life either with alcohol or without it. Then he will know loneliness such as few do. He will be at the jumping off place. He will wish for the end. That was my experience too. That That's was right. where I was as well. That was where I was when I heard that. We have shown how we got out of from under. And you say, yes, I am willing, but am I to be consigned to a life where I shall be stupid, boring and glum, like some righteous people I see? I know I must get along without liquor, but how can I? Have you a sufficient substitute? Yes, there is a sub substitute, and it is basically more than that. It's a fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. When they wrote that, there was no fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. There was no fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous when they wrote that. They're talking about the fellowship of people who are living in this book. That's what they were talking about when they wrote that. Not the fellowship as we understand today, but the fellowship of people who are living by the directions in this book. After this book was published, it was six months before there was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, one of my favorite books is Lord of the Rings, and it's a fellowship of the ring. They had a purpose. And I think it was the same with the guys in this, in this book. They had a purpose. Hmm. Uh, 
There you will find release from care, boredom, and worry. Your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. The most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. Thus we find the fellowship, and so will you. How is that to come about, you ask? Where am I to find these people? You are going to meet these new friends in your own community. Near you, alcoholics are dying helplessly, like people in a sinking ship. If you live in a large place, there are hundreds. High and low, rich and poor, these are the future fellows of Alcoholics Anonymous. Among them you will find, you will make lifelong friends. You will be bound to them with new and wonderful ties. For you will escape disaster together, and you will commence shoulder to shoulder your common journey. Then you will know what it means to give of yourself that others may survive and rediscover life. You will learn the full meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. Notice it says then, after you've found these people. And they're not talking about finding people in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're talking about going out and finding alcoholics who need, who need and want to recover. It says then you'll know what it means. That's when we start to, that's step 12. We're right at the end here. It's, it's, that's where we get the joy. It may seem incredible that these men are to become happy, respected and useful once more. How can they rise out of such misery, bad repute and hopelessness? The practical answer is that since these things have happened among us, they can happen with you. Now, there is two conditions. There are always conditions in this book. Nothing comes for free. We have two conditions now. Condition one. Should you wish them above all else? All else. And be willing to make use of your experience. Our experience. Of our experience. Sorry. <laughs> we are sure they will come. The age of miracles is still with us. Our own recovery proves that. Okay, so I've got to be open-minded enough to listen to what these people have got to say. This book was written by the first 100, started off with the first 40, and it was their collective experience. I've got to be open-minded enough to read the black parts of this book that t describe their experience and not put my experience in into the white, white spaces in between the black parts. That's what the lay aside prayer is all about. Lay aside what I think I know. Further into this book, it says that the main problem the alcoholic sent is in his mind rather than his body. I have a mind that interprets what I see in here. I've got to lay that aside and read the black part. Our, our hope is that when this chip of a book is launch, launched on the world tide of alcoholism, Defeated drinkers will seize upon it to follow its suggestions. And, and, and yeah. that's, that's grabbing it like a drowning person. They've talked about a ship sinking. There's another part in the book where they talk about people drowning from a ship, ship sinking. I'm drowning in a sea of alcoholism. I'm grabbing this book with both hands like a drowning person. I was, I was taught um, life-saving when I was a kid, and I was told that a person who is drowning and you're trying to save them in the water can drown you with their desperation not to drown. So you may have to render them unconscious in order to save their lives or push them under till they stop breathing and drag them out and then give them, rest, uh, give them mouth to mouth or whatever. So that's what they're talking about. This isn't, a, this isn't something that we do casually. Our life depends upon following the directions in this book. You'll see when we go into step one, we'll find out how much our lives depend upon this. And also I have to ask myself, am I defeated? Defeated drinkers will seize upon it. Many, we are sure, will rise to their feet and march on. 
They will approach still other sick ones, and fellowships of Alcoholics Anonymous may spring up in each city and hamlet, havens for those who must find a way out. Is that me? Must I find a way out? Is my situation so intolerable that I need to find a way out no matter what? And again, it's about living in the book. It's about following the directions in the book. Fellowships, more than one. Fellowships of Alcoholics Anonymous. Little groups of threes, fives, and six of us following the directions in the book. Not one big, huge fellowship. Little fellowships. It's interesting. If you read the Black Part, and it's re interesting. It, you get to see it in a new way. Okay. We, we're going to go... You look at table of contents? How yep. it's laid out? Page Roman numeral V, 5. It's a very interesting book, this. I think this book is like a workshop manual. I used to, I used to, to repair old motorcycles. And every time I got a new motorcycle, I would go out and I'd buy a workshop manual that told me how to tear it down and how to put it back together again so it ran. It, it showed me how to, how to tune it up and how to make it run really well. And that's exactly what this book is about. This book is about tearing down an alcoholic and putting him back together again so he runs without alcohol. It's a workshop manual. It's not a holy book. It's an inspired book, but it's not, it's not scripture. This is a very practical book. It's going to tear me down. It's going to put me back together again. So I run without alcohol. Okay, do you want to do that? Well, if you go to the contents, it's um, uh, we have... Four chapters about the problem. That means I have to know what's wrong with me. You know, Bill and, and the others spent how many pages? 52. Uh, 52 pages to explain what is wrong with us. Because if I don't know what the problem is, I can't do anything about it. And if I don't know what's wrong with me, I cannot teach it. And I'm useless if I don't know what's wrong with me. So we have four chapters that is describing the problem. And that is the doctor's opinion. Dr. Silkworth, a non-alcoholic doctor who was the first one to understand that we had this allergy. And he describes that in the book. And the mental obsession as well. And Bill's story, where Bill tells us the progression of alcoholism and how, how he was, what happened. It's a 12-step call, really. Bill, Bill's story is a 12-step call. I was told yeah. to read Bill's story. The first half of Bill's story, the first eight pages of Bill's story, underline everywhere where I thought like Bill, where I drank like Bill, where I felt like Bill. The second half is Bill's story is about his recovery, and I was told to read through that and underline every, everything in that part of the, the eight pages that I had resistance to, yes. that I didn't want to do. Because Bill describes in great detail what he did to recover. And, I've got, I, I, and, and there was some stuff there I didn't want to do, that I had resistance to. But it's a great way of looking at it. Okay, do I think I'm as hopeless as Bill by underlining the parts in Bill's story where I drank like Bill, felt like Bill, and thought like Bill, I'm identifying with Bill. I'm a real alcoholic. Now he does certain things to recover. Am I willing to go to any? Am I willing to do what he did to recover? Mm. And then there is chapter. There is a solution that tells us about the the common solution, but also tells us more, even more about alcoholism. And then we have more. Even more about alcoholism. <laughs> we don't get it yet. Yeah. There's some more. We're difficult. Okay. You see, we don't hear. No. We can't hear. When we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I can't hear what you're saying. You've got to talk very slowly and very loudly to me because I don't hear. I translate what you're saying. I don't hear what you're saying. It's the same when I read. I sort of put my spin on what I'm reading. I've got to try to, to lay that aside. Am I desperate enough to actually listen to what you're saying? And in, in this book, you will find 
that when they say something in italics, it's like in neon. Okay, so there's something in this book is in italics, it's neon. If they say it to you twice in this book, they are saying it very slowly and loudly. If they say it three times, they are yelling at you. Yeah. Listen, dummy. <laughs> I don't hear. I've got to be told again and again, what is my experience? Because I don't know what the hell's going on. Okay. The solution. The next chapter is the solution. We agnostics. And then we have three chapters. How it works, interaction, and working with others that describe the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. How many pages between that page 58 and 89? 30 pages. From step 3 to step 12. That's not very much. This is a big old book, but they spend almost as much time telling us what's wrong with this as they t describe the program. It's only 30 pages. 30 pages, 58 to, 58 to 88, pretty much. And we're through. We can do this real quick, but we've got to linger first and find out exactly what's wrong with us. Mm -hmm. start off with the doctor's opinion. Let's go to step one. Let me read step one first because it's interesting. Go to page 59 and we'll read, we'll read step one. This is the best kept secret in Alcoholics Anonymous, page 58 and 59, you know, um, and halfway down page 60. Best kept secret in Alcoholics Anonymous, those three pages, because most meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous read this out at the beginning of the meeting. And do you know that they, they even put it on a laminated piece of paper? that they've taken it out of the big book and they've laminated it so that someone can read from, make it easy for them to read. It goes on a double-side A4 sheet. Terrific. Great. But there are people in Alcoholics Anonymous that don't know that that chapter comes from this book and is actually chapter 5 in this book and not chapter 1. They think it's just something you read at the beginning of a meeting. They don't even hear it because they're thinking about what they're going to say once the meeting starts. <laughs> And that was exactly how it was at my meetings. Now it's my turn. Me, 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 me. Every meeting they read this from a plastic pamphlet. And nobody knew where it came from. And I didn't because no, nobody used the big book. How I really, it works. I really, really don't like laminations in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> When I first came to AA, we had, we had the big book and everybody was reading the big book and there was these old Glaswegian gangsters that said, you can read anything you like out of the big book as long as it's chapter 3, 5 or 11. <laughs> and at my second meeting, I heard chapter 11 and I was exactly as it described. Perfect for me. Step one. It's got two bits. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. That's the easy bit. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing in Alcoholics Anonymous unless I'm powerless over alcohol? If you're powerless over something else, what are you doing in Alcoholics Anonymous? We can point you in the right direction. We have a singleness of person, purpose here also. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. If you've got something else, we can show you where to go. There are wonderful fellowships out there. That's part of what we do. But we are, you see, if you read the, if you read the long form of the third tradition. It doesn't say the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. It actually says our membership ought to include all those who suffer from alcoholism. That's as it was originally written. You, we will see very shortly that the only requirement for membership is no good. <laughs> you can be a member of the fellowship and ain't going to do anything to you for your sobriety. There's a dash. We admit we're powerless over alcohol. There's a dash. That means new idea. Two ideas in the first step. The second idea in the first step is my life has become unmanageable. I like to try and read everything in the big book in the first person. We're going to use later on, we're going to, when we're looking at the steps, we're going, to, we're going to look at the original manuscript, which talks to me directly. You see, every time they say we in this book, they say we enough in this book, I start to think it's about them and not about me. It's about them. It's about the folks who wrote the book. They wrote the book in 1939. That's a long time ago. Nothing to do with me. So I admitted I was powerless over alcohol. I didn't know what that meant. 
we're going to find out, and that my life had become unmanageable. I thought that was the goofy stuff I did when I was drinking. Let's see. <laughs> hmm. Doctor Spin? Yeah, we'll start oh, at. Go for uh, it. Well, this is um, William Doc D. Silkworth. Um, Bill and the others asked him to write about his opinion about alcoholism, and he said, "Well, I will do that, but I will, I will call it doctor's opinion because that." was his opinion at that time. He didn't have any scientific evidence for that this was true at that time. But today, today we know this is true. And he didn't even want to sign his name the in, the, in the beginning because of his reputation and his work. But uh, later on he said, now you can put my name there. <laughs> and... Um, he writes about this allergy. He could see the alcoholics come and go, come and go to this hospital, town's hospital where he worked. <laughs> and he could see that some people came and uh, they were there and they went home and they didn't come back. A sufficient reason that they could stop drinking. But there was some people that came back over and over and over again. And he understood that it's, it's something else with these people. It's not that they, that they want to drink. It's that they, they cannot um, hold the decision not to drink again. You know, when they went home, they, they had vitamins, they had uh, uh, good food, and he said, you know, don't drink now when you come home. Oh, no, I won't. I, I feel so okay now. And three weeks later, they were there again. What happened? What happened? And this doctor, he understood that is something with the body it's not only a lack of willpower. It's something with their bodies that is different from other people. And this is what he writes about that. We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics, that chronic means that it's, it happens over and over and over again. This is, this is page XXVIII, by the way. Yes. Page 28 in the Roman numerals. XXVIII. <laughs> Who ever thought of that? It used to be. Now, this is the other thing: is in the first edition. In the first edition, it was step. It was page one in the in the Arabic numerals. It was page one, and in the second edition, they put it into the forwards, mm. and we stopped reading it. Mm. And this page is crucial. This page is one of the most crucial pages in the big book because it tells me what's wrong with me from somebody that ain't an alcoholic mm. that has looked at us and said, there's something wrong with these people. They are unusual. <laughs> yes. Um, the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. And manifestation is that it shows up as. An allergy in medical terms means abnormal reaction to. It doesn't mean specifically you break out in spots. It's an abnormal reaction to. It's an, and what the doctor is doing, he is writing not just for us, but he's writing for other doctors. That, so the doctors will understand what he's saying. And that's why he uses some very strange words in here. But he's, he's writing not just for us, he's writing for other doctors, and particularly for other doctors, because we understood once, we, once we, we know about the allergy, it makes sense to us. But he's trying to talk to other doctors as well. And allergy, all doctors understand, is an abnormal reaction to. Yes. But an allergy for me, when I heard that the first time, I thought, how can I be allergic to alcohol? I drink so much. <laughs> I drink huge amounts of alcohol. How can I be allergic to alcohol? But it, it, it was explained to me that it, that it doesn't show up like a spots or, 
or that I my in my throat or anything. It it I can just feel it. It's a craving for more. The allergy is a, a physical craving for more. My body craves more alcohol when I put alcohol into my body. It's not the alcohol in itself. It is that I have a body that reacts different, that creates a physical craving for more. I mean, my twin sister doesn't have that. I have a different body that as soon as I put alcohol into it, my body craves more. But I think that it's, it comes as, as a thought that I want more as soon as I have put alcohol into my body. And I heard many people say, oh, I'm, I'm craving alcohol today. I feel like I'm, I want to drink, you know. And th that's, that is not the, the allergy. That is the mental obsession that I am thinking of, I'm longing for. I can only have the craving when I have put alcohol into my body. Then my body craves more. And it doesn't show, I can just feel it. I want more. I have to have more. The craving translating itself into a thought is very like if you hold your breath for a long period of time. Your body starts to crave oxygen. It will transmit itself into a thought in your brain. Breathe, dummy. You see, it's, it's, I mean, you can't commit suicide by holding your breath. And an alcoholic cannot live without drinking. It's sort of the same thing. But I'm going to drink no matter what. You know, I, we sometimes hear, we sometimes hear this is the, 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 the obsession will take me back to a drink. Once I'm drinking, the allergy is like breathing. That my body is craving alcohol like I crave breath. It's a chemical thing. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but we, we metabolize alcohol differently from other people. We don't do it as fast as other folks. It hangs around in our bodies. Our bodies react by doing a couple of things. One of the things is that it produces an, a codeine-like substance that makes us feel good. I think different from, I don't have an experience of being a normal, normal drinker, but I think us alcoholics, we have a different reaction to alcohol. I mean, like Margareta describes her twin sister, after three drinks, she wants to go to sleep. Margareta wants to go party. I'm the same. It's a different reaction, both both physically, but also also beforehand mentally. The doctor continues. Mm. That the phenomena, and phenomena is something that you can see, but you cannot explain. Isn't that so? That is so. I suffer from, and I showed somebody this morning, when I came in and I started put to, to, to do some stuff, um, I have something called Raynaud's phenomena. And that means that the blood drains out of my fingers, that they go white. Okay. Now, Dr. Reno saw it, said, oh, that's peculiar. I wonder how that happens. Couldn't figure it out, but had observed it. So he knows it's true, but cannot explain it. And that's exactly what Dr. Silkworth is saying to the other doctors. I have seen this, but I can't explain it. Now, they know why, why Reno's phenomenon works now. They also know how the allergy works. It's, I'm not an expert. I'm not a scientist. I'm just an old drunk. And I don't, I'm not going to go into detail with that because I might get it wrong. But you can do some research if you want to find out. What my sponsor said to me, it doesn't matter whether how you get the, the, the allergy, except that you get it. My experience told me I got it. Accept that. We've got to accept a lot of stuff. I, d I don't have to explain everything, which is the other thing that my mind wants me to do. It's explain everything. If I can accept that I have an allergy to alcohol, it explains many things which I otherwise could not explain. Mm. How come Fred went home? My buddy Fred went home after two drinks and I was still there at midnight when they threw me out. Mm. I wanted to go home as much as Fred did. Something was keeping me there. A phenomenon of craving. I was drinking. 
Yeah, and the phenomena of craving, craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Never. 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 Now, I'm going to, I'm going to jump forward. I'm going to jump forward to another page. Pa chapter 3, page 30. Halfway down page 30. We're talking about the phenomenon of craving and the, and the mental obsession. Halfway down it says, we learned by our sponsor telling us. My sponsor, Billy, told me I had an allergy to alcohol. He backed it up with the doctor's opinion, page 28 in the Roman numerals. He also said that I had an obsession when I wasn't drinking that, about alcohol. I could identify with that too, because that's all I ever thought about. When I was going to get it, did I have enough money to buy it? Where was I going to go? I couldn't go to the same place twice in the same day. When I went into the supermarket to, to buy alcohol, I always bought a loaf of bread. So I wasn't just buying alcohol. I would buy something to eat. I see people doing it all the time. I know. I know what you're doing. Great big bottle of vodka, bag of bagels. <laughs> I know what you're doing. We learned we had to we learned. We had to fully concede to our innermost selves. Lay aside everything you think you know what's wrong with you. Fully concede to our innermost selves at a gut level in the marrow, marrow of my bones, that I'm an alcoholic. I have an allergy to alcohol. I have an allergy to, to some dairy products too. I don't drink, I don't eat those particular dairy products. I sometimes do my, by mistake, but not, but not on purpose. However, the mental obsession took me back to alcohol every time. We'll get into that. But there it says, this is the first step in recovery. So we take the first step by fully conceding to our innermost selves that we're alcoholic. We're going to look at how, we're going to look a little bit more about why we're alcoholic. But then it says that the delusion, and this is one of them again, another very important statement in this big book: the delusion that we are like other people. Now the doctor just said that we are different from other people. The delusion that we are like other people. Just because I'm not drinking now, I'm like everybody else. Uh. -uh. I'm not. I'm alcoholic. That means that I do things different from normal people. It says that the delusion, in my mind, delusion, it's in your brain. It looks like I'm like other people, but I'm not. My head will tell me that I'm like other people, but I'm not. All the evidence proves that. I'm standing in my shower in the morning, showering. My mind is telling me stuff that bears absolutely no relationship to my life whatsoever. I understand. <laughs> I'm different. It says here, or presently maybe, which means sometime soon. Okay, so I'm not like other people right now, but maybe in a few weeks, I'll stay sober a few weeks, I will be. Uh -uh. Presently maybe, or soon maybe, has to be smashed. Not broken, not put aside, smashed. If you drop a cup and it breaks in two pieces, you can glue it back together again. Get some of that super glue stuff back together. Don't put anything too hot in there, though, because it will fall apart again. But, but you can glue it back together. If you smash a cup, get a hammer and smash a cup into little pieces, you won't be able to put it back together again. That's what they're telling us. They're telling us that we've got to believe that we are alcoholic at such a level that it cannot be reconstructed. And they spend this 52 pages telling us what's wrong with us so that we get it. Okay, so we're talking about the allergy. The doctors get the allergy. Yes, and I have to ask myself, is this me? Do I have this allergy? And I have to look at my experience. Those times where I didn't want to get drunk, but I got drunk anyway. You know, do I have this allergy? It's very important that I understand that I am an alcoholic or not. Do I have this allergy or not? And I was thinking about so many times when I didn't, I didn't, I just wanted to drink a little, but I got drunk. And one, one example was I was, uh, trying to be sober, I was restless, irritable, and discontent, 
And my daughter called me and she said, why don't you come and see me? And I took the train down to Stockholm because I thought that will make me feel better. So I went there and she phoned me and said, I can't be home just when you come, but I will come in a few hours. And I was alone and I, was, I, I, I thought I'd gone all this way and she's not even home. And I came in there and, the, and she just met a new boyfriend and there were bottles everywhere. There were blue ones, green ones, I don't know. I, and I was, I, I, and that insane thought took over and I thought, I just have a little. I just take a little bit of that blue stuff. They won't notice that, you know. And I started to drink and, the, and I couldn't stop, you know. And a few hours later when she came home, I was in the bed, passed out with, a, we call it 75, 75 centiliters of pure alcohol in my hand, passed out. And her boyfriend asked, how, but why did your mother have to drink the best grand? <laughs> he'd been, he's a musician and he's abroad and he buys very expensive uh, alcohol. And I had taken that when the other stuff didn't work. You know? <laughs> so, and he said, why did she have to drink the, the most expensive brand that I had? And my daughter said to him, well, you see, Pete, uh, Tommy, he's called Tommy, that my mother, she doesn't care about the brand <laughs> because she is after the effect. And when she starts to drink, she cannot stop. She knew more about alcoholism than I did. And that was, you know... How the allergy, that was not my intention. I was going to go there and have a nice time with my daughter. My intention was to have a few drinks to take the edge off. That was not my intention. I didn't like to wake up. I can tell you that. <laughs> That's the problem. We always wake up, don't we? And the interesting thing is that, that Margaret's daughter knew that explanation of Margareta was not because she'd read it in a book. No. It's because she had observed it in Margareta. Okay, now, we're, I, I am doing that as well, and I don't see it in me, but everybody else does. And I'm deluded that I'm like other people, that it's all okay. Delusion. Mm. So I have to ask myself, is this me? Does my experience show that I have this allergy because it's very very important because if I can control my drinking what am I doing here then I would be home and control my drinking and these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all okay two little words never think about that little word never and then it says, in any form at all. I'm very, very, I read labels. I'm very careful what I use. I read labels. Because any form at all, alcohol in any form at all, ingested. And I have drunk aftershave. Okay, when I was drinking. I have drunk aftershave. There was nothing else. It's about 70 proof. Old Spice and Coca-Cola tastes awful, but it, hit, but it hits the spot, okay, when there's nothing else. Okay. I, I use aftershave, but I don't have, a, I don't have a, 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 a compulsion to mix it with Coca-Cola anymore. All right, that's been removed, okay. <laughs> But think about never. They talk about never in here a lot. There's little words in here which, which are incredible. We can just zoom over. It's the little words that we need to watch in this book. Okay. Yes, and I have, I, it, it's my responsibility to watch for that. Yeah. yeah. 
Because if I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol, my body doesn't feel the difference from different kinds of alcohol. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And I have to watch for that. Like when you are cooking wine, you use wine. I thought that the wine was boiled away, but I've heard it's not. No. After an hour of cooking, or well, actually after three hours of cooking um, a coq au vin, which is, which is a chicken that's cooked in red wine, uh, there is uh, nearly 80% of the alcohol still left after three hours. It doesn't burn off. When you flambe something, it doesn't burn off. It's only the aromatics that burn off. The alcohol is still there. So any form at all. I live in a country where they use wine in food all the time. They, they don't even, you ask them if they put alcohol in this and they don't say, oh, no, 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 just a couple of glasses, just a couple, little bit of red wine. <laughs> wine is not alcohol in France. It's a beverage that they use with the food. No, seriously, we laugh at that, but it is seriously, culturally, it's something you have with your meal. It's perfectly normal. In France, they don't have more alcoholism than they have in America. Worldwide, we are 8 to 10% of the population. Wherever, wherever we go, wherever we go, we're different. We're born this way. We're different. There are some people who maybe acquire this, but we're different. Yes. Let's, quickly, let's quickly move on to, we've got 10 minutes to finish before Jeff, Jeff unplugs us. Ten minutes, yeah, that's right. We better move on. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta accelerate here. Yes. Okay. Uh, Finish that first paragraph though, because it's important. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and that includes pills as well. Solid alcohol. Yes. Okay. And Solid one... alcohol. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And once having formed a habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishing, astonishingly difficult to solve. And these are the consequences of my drinking. And I thought that's what they meant by the unmanageability of my life in that first step. The consequences of my drinking. My problems, that I, I drank more because my problems were piling up on me. I couldn't face my problems, so I drank some more. I had more problems. And I thought that's what they meant by the unmanageability of my life. Mm. The last paragraph on that page. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Everybody. They're not talking specifically about alcoholics here. They're talking about everybody. Everybody enjoys alcohol. The sensation is so elusive. Now they're talking about alcoholics. What does that mean? What's elusive mean? Elusive means I can't always pin it down. It's like I was saying the, the, the last night that I'm walking. I, I, I'm 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 walking back from the from the the shop after buying a bottle of wine. I haven't taken a drink yet, but I feel okay. Yeah, another time I'll drink all night and I won't feel like that. It says that they that while they admit it's injurious, this is not this is doing me harm, it's hurting me, they cannot after a while differentiate the true from the false. Where do I differentiate the true from the false in my mind? I don't, I can't see what's right, what's true, and I can't see what's false. I can't see it. I don't have a sense of proportion. Margareta's daughter could see it. Margareta couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. My father could see it. To them, their alcoholic life becomes the only normal one. What have I sacrificed of normal life in order to drink? For me, it was a career at sea. It was a marriage. It was relationships. It was jobs. It was money. I, I, everything so that I could drink. I changed through my drinking from being someone that looked kind of like fairly normal to this. I was a freak. Hair, beard, starey eyes. Not that I say that's, a, that's, that's wrong. I, I mean, I, I would quite like the idea of having quite long hair and a long beard. <laughs> but, but I looked like I, I was weird. 
<laughs> I hung out with people who were strange, and they said they uh, I've found them. They say we thought you were really weird. Now it says they are restless, Ill irritable, and discontent. What does that mean? Restless. You know, I had the leg thing going. You know, the leg, the leg going up and down. I can still sort of do it. I've got to tell it to do it. Though. That was going all the time. I was tapping the table all the time. I was scratching. I was shifting. I, was, I wasn't staying in relationships. I wasn't staying in jobs. I wasn't staying in places where I lived. I was moving around. Restless. Can't sit still. Can't stay in one place. Irritable. Irritable means that I'm, I'm quick to anger. I used to get ballistic. You'd walk past me and wouldn't say hello. I'd carry that around with me for the next week. Get angry at you very quick. I would fall into depressions walking down the street. The sun would go behind a building. Mm. You know? I knew you were talking behind my back. I knew you were talking about me. And what you were saying wasn't good. I never thought good thoughts. And I was, I was ambushed by this stuff. And discontent. Discontent means that it, I'm not occasionally, it's no good. It's everything is not quite good enough. You know, sunny day. Oh, it's too hot. <laughs> you know, new car. Wrong color. <laughs> you know, wrong wheels. Wrong tires. Whatever. You know, and the same thing happened with relationships. Everything. Everything was not quite good enough. That's what it said. That's what. That, that's I'm, unless, unless I can again experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes out once from taking a few drinks, then it's okay. <coughs> then the car's fine. I don't care what you're thinking. I'll go find a new girlfriend. Where I live is okay as long as I got the booze in the cup. It's okay. So what the doctor just said was that alcohol is now my solution to my life. And it doesn't matter what happens in my life, as long as I have my solution, it's all okay. My alcoholic life becomes the only normal one. For me. Not for the other people, they're looking at me like, Are you, this guy's crazy. But for me, it's normal. And I will accept everything. As long as I can keep drinking, I will accept everything that happens to me. It's when I'm not drinking that I'm irritable, restless, and discontent. And the obsession is that I can remember what it was like taking a few drinks. Those early drinks that I took where I started to breathe for the first time in my life. That, oh. Normal drinkers don't get that, you know. They kind of just relax and they get goofy and they go, oh, yeah, I had enough now. But I go, oh, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> you know, that's different chemical. That's a chemical reaction within my body that does that. Set off by the breakdown of alcohol in my body. But when it's not in my body, I'm obsessing about that. I need something to take the edge off. We're going to run out of time. We're going to get to the doctor. We're going to have to. We're going, to, we're going to do a couple of sessions on step one. We've got some more stuff to look at in the book. We're going to take a 15-minute break, is it, Jeff? 15-minute cigarette break now. We're going to look at the two chapters. Next, we're going to quickly zoom through the two chapters, then we're going to get into the, into the solution. Because by the time you've had another 40 minutes on what's wrong with you, you've got enough now, you should have enough. <laughs> but there's no hope in these papers. Okay, 15-minute break. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.